This is another episode of Stand Up Comedy, your host and MC, celebrating 40 plus years on the fringe of show business. Stories, interviews, and comedy sets from the famous and not so famous. Here's your host and MC, Scott Edwards. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this week's podcast. Man, I am so excited to have something fun for you. I'm in Los Angeles, California, doing some comedy roundtables. And tonight, I have some terrific friends from the business uh, sitting with us. Uh, originally from uh, D.C., you've seen him on TV. He was on CSI, uh, West Wing, Seinfeld, ER, Friends, you name it. He's done them all. Ladies and gentlemen, Stan Sellers is in the house. Stan, thanks so much for joining us. And that's enough of that. Man, <laughs> where did all those people come from, Stan? <laughs> and joining him, a guy that uh, I haven't had a, a chance to really chat with uh, in many years, but it used to be one of our favorite regulars. Both these guys headlined the club for many years. Uh, an ex-school teacher, he went on to tour with people like Brad Garrett, Arsenio Hall, and George Lopez, one of the funniest guys in America. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Jimmy Burns! Wow! In America! <laughs> Woohoo! I crisscross the country, man. <laughs> Come on, man. Hey guys, thanks for joining me in the podcast. Uh, it's terrific to uh, be down here in Southern California, getting a chance to meet with old friends. And Stan and I have uh, stayed somewhat connected, but haven't actually seen each other since your birthday, uh, probably right. 25 years ago. <laughs> well, that was the big 5 so that was 12 years ago. Okay, almost, so it's been a while. Almost 13 years ago. Wow. And Jimmy, yeah. haven't yeah. seen you since you worked the club, so I know that's, that's right. over 20 years. Um, you did another room down there for a brief... Was, I, I was, was I've you. done a few little adventures. I still do fundraisers two or three years, so that's cool. why we should connect. All right. And uh, work. Hello. There you go. <laughs> I brought my calendar. I get to There you December. go. It's 1993, <laughs> but still. <laughs> it's a calendar. It is, but it's my Laughs Unlimited executive planner. And that is so cool. So uh, one year is gifts to the comics. We put together executive planners with the Laughs logo on it. Well, well, and not Jimmy, all the comics. Oh, well, the comics that worked in 1993. I remember, I got a plastic mug, which uh, I, should, I should have brought that. What? <laughs> a plastic mug. Yeah, I think I worked St. Patrick's Day that year. You used to have oh, green beer. You used to have green beer, yes, yeah. Yes. Buck of beer, boy, back That's in those, what I those got. were the days. That was a great club. That yeah, was a great just club. just got to say. And then upstairs? The Magic oh, Hat. Magic Hat? Yeah. Oh, so Those cool. were the days. Those were the days. Oh, well, thanks yep. for saying something. I kind of enjoyed it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, it was a blast. Stand-up comedy turned out to be uh, my life's joy, and owning that uh, small chain of comedy clubs allowed me to not only work with professionals like you guys uh, and build friendships that lasted 40-plus years, but... It also brought me out of my shell. I, I don't know if you noticed, I would be on stage once in a while. Once in a once, while? Uh, <laughs> like Tuesday through Sunday? Yeah. <laughs> two shows. It's just Saturday, for two, two minutes, shows. right? If the mic was on, he was on. <laughs> he was there. Oh, man. Well, so uh, like, we're sitting backstage. We couldn't get him off stage. Yeah. So. <laughs> Give him a light. You know, right. What? Is he still doing yeah. time? The owner's getting the light. You know it's bad when that's man, happening. Actually, <laughs> that room was magical. Uh, well, thank you. I, I thought we, you know, had the right atmosphere for Firehouse, comedy. Right? Firehouse yeah, Alley, Firehouse yes. Alley. Yeah. Um, what I wanted to say was that Stan has already been on one of the interviews, so the audience has some of his background. Uh, real quick, Jimmy, why don't you uh, share with the audience kind of how you fell into stand-up comedy, because you've made a lifelong career out of it. How did it kind of all start? Uh, it started because, do we want to be real or do we want, anyway, I started it's out as a school teacher. Right, you were a school teacher. You started doing comedy while you were teaching? Yes, I did. Oh, wow. Uh, I was married. I was looking for attention because I wasn't getting any at home. <laughs> <laughs> so I started, I wanted to be a clown. I wanted to bring joy to people. I wanted to make people laugh. Because my hero growing up was Johnny Carson. Oh, yes. Yeah. For most of us. Yeah. yeah. But he was from Omaha, Nebraska. There you go. Well, actually born in Iowa, raised in Norfolk, Nebraska. <laughs> Look, you know the history. Oh, yeah. Johnny. I never, nobody ever understood the joke when I tried to say, my mom said, what do you want to do? I said, I want a job behind the desk. And just, they didn't know what that just meant. Just like Johnny Carson. Yeah. yeah. Nope. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, were you just uh, went while you were teaching, you started doing some open mics and it yeah. kind of clicked? Omaha, Nebraska. Now, when I started, whew, there was really, there was no clubs. And so it was a talent show at a Club 89, a restaurant. And I just, they said, uh, oh, you'll enjoy this because I'd never done comedy before. I'd seen it, and so I tried to put my little act together, and then I did an audition. 
and I'm these these people, these kids are singing. I thought it was a record in his office, and it came out, and there was these four little girls. They were it was they were amazing, and they were auditioning too. Yeah, now I'm intimidated horribly. <laughs> so I walk in, and I he goes, "What do you do?" And I go, "I'm a stand up comedian." Really? I said, "Yeah." I said, "He goes, okay, go ahead." And I went, <laughs> "Can we shut the door?" I wanted to shut the door where everybody was standing. He goes, all right, go shut the door. And I shut the door and I turn around and start walking. May goes, you know, the night of the show, we have to leave the door open. <laughs> Great answer. I know. And uh, I started doing that. And he had me back for the finals, even though I didn't qual- come anywhere near qualifying. Mm-hmm. And that's where Larry Omaha and I met, too. Same night? No, different night. But, uh, yeah, I started that. And then they sent me down to a, that was during the summer. A radio station in the in the old market in Omaha, Nebraska, and I'd get on the radio once in a while, and then it just happened. Start doing more and more. They had, every once in a while, a comedy room would open, a comedy night would open, let's say, and you get a there. chance to get some stage time. So this is the big test. You remember any of your original material, any early jokes? Yeah, to share us one. What, basically, uh, there was no meat on the McDonald's hamburger. I found it hiding under my pickle. <laughs> Something like that. I don't yeah, know. Well, that, that kind of goes along with, where's the beef? Well, exactly. Remember those old commercials? Yeah. <laughs> oh, so here's the comedy move that I made. I moved to Los Angeles because that's where I wanted to be with beaches and comedy. And then the comedy clubs opened up all through the Midwest. So all my friends who stayed in Omaha were getting stage time and gigs. Throughout the Midwest. All over the place. Yeah. And I'm standing in line out here, eking out three minutes here, maybe <laughs> five minutes here. Ah, yeah, but the reality is, if they wanted to get seriously into the business, they'd have to come out west. And guess what? They started over. Yep. Yeah. You know, you true. you you. If you started in L.A. and did the waiting in line and and kissing up to Bud and and them to to get three minutes on stage, once you got seen, right, the right people were seeing you. You could be killing it in Omaha. And if you go to New York, San Francisco, or L.A., guess what? You were starting over. Yeah. I took yeah. a six-week vacation one summer during the teaching, when I was still teaching. We went to Chicago, and then we went to San Francisco, and then we went to L.A. to see where I would want to move. And I eventually figured I'd be in L.A. might as well come out here now. So I've been out here for 30, 40 years. You know, I did the same thing. I started, well, I started here for a couple of months, actually back in D.C. Came here for about three months. My cousin told me to come up to San Francisco. I didn't have a job. So I really cut my teeth at the Holy City Zoo. Holy City Zoo. I worked Zoo. there for nine months. And wow. I had good. But a lot of the comics there wanted to come to L.A. They didn't know or think they were ready. Right. That was the big move in San Francisco. That's smart. And I said to myself, well, I'm going to jump in. I'm going to jump in the pool now. I'm not going to wait right. another two, three, four years or whatever. I felt I was good enough. I right, but cutting your teeth at the Holy City Zoo, I mean, we're talking Robin Williams, Dana Carvey, a, a lot club. of people. That was the club where you could try out anything. And it's anything. been shared before, but the Holy City Zoo was about 24 seats. The stage yeah. was maybe eight square feet tops, and there was a balcony that held three people. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> it, think, was, yeah. it was <laughs> a, a really unique comedy room. It's a but, good workspace. Boy, people came out of that room, uh, superstars. This is First true. wife, yeah. hanging out there. We were sitting there, and she is never starstruck. She's never, oh, I don't need, you know. Robin Williams walked in. Jim, Jim, look, look, it's Robin, it's Robin. Oh, I thought you weren't starstruck. <laughs> <laughs> and then he get it and do his thing. It was amazing. Yeah, yeah. Holy City Zoo was great. Yeah. yeah, well, and Robin had that effect. I mean, he, I was blessed. He played my stage twice at, on a walk-on. Yeah? And... Uh, just getting him on my stage and getting to work with him those two nights. Um, I mean, I've worked with some pretty big names and it, that was still pretty awestruck, but, yeah. but, yeah. uh, you know, Robin was one of a kind. So you guys both kind of, uh, cut your teeth on the road. You ended up in LA. Um, I know that Stan ended up doing a lot of acting. Um, yeah. did you, how did you switch over? Cause you were a solid headliner. What made you switch from headliner? And a great writer. I got to well, add, he's a wonderful writer. Well, thank you, Jimmy. Well, there you go. Yeah. Per, per future gig right I, there. I, I, I admired <laughs> his writing always. Go we ahead. We know each other's talents. Didn't mean to cut you uh, off, but I wanted to get in there. You're I, a great uh, writer. I, w- I had always been acting, you know, which you learned from a first interview. Right. That I'd done theater. So I always had an agent, even when I was doing stand-up. So my agent was always sending me out. And I really, uh, I'd done some small things. I'd done a couple of soap operas. A few lines here and there, and a few lines here, and then some small shows. But when I booked that first Seinfeld, it was the second season. 
and that opened the door to a lot of other casting agents because I didn't have anything better than the Seinfeld on the resume. And casting agents would say to me, well, you got Seinfeld on your resume, so you must be pretty good. <laughs> so I was, well, I was, you know, I was getting... I, they were bringing me in for other things, and I was booking. So I always had yeah, uh, I mentioned solid agents. Several that, of the uh, shows. I mean, getting ER and Friends, and some of the biggest shows. West some Wing. really good shows. Yeah, yeah. I now, built a really good resume early on. So. The um, one of the things that's fascinating to me is that a lot of actors in LA have to wait tables. Is like the famous thing, or bartend while they're waiting, doing auditions and waiting for gigs. You were actually making a living doing stand up. Yeah. And then, and I know you raised two kids that way, not easy. Well, I was married at the time. Well, I'm, no, I'm just saying that, that. So my wife was the breadwinner. Oh, okay. Okay. That, that she helped. was making the most money, yeah. <laughs> so definitely, yeah, during the uh, early years. But, but you didn't uh, have to do the waiting tables and bartending because you were no, going was, between auditions and, and comedy gigs. Exactly. Now, Jimmy, you yeah. were doing stand up uh, all through. You went, you finally, uh, what year did you give up teaching school? I think it was 1984. No, that's pretty taught, early on in the comedy wave, I call it. Yeah, uh, I taught in Omaha, Nebraska. Well, that's where I started. I taught there for five years. And then I moved and taught in the private school in Encino, Egremont. Oh, that's in Chatsworth. Well, there's one in Chatsworth, too. Oh, okay. The one we were on uh, was on Louise. Yeah, Sally Field's oh. kid was in the school and stuff. And the, and the, that's uh, a really good school. Yeah, the Jacksons. Their kids were in. Guess where my daddy is? Where's your daddy? He's on the victory tour. So well, so you had the the right kids in your class, oh, yeah. but uh, so how did you transition? Well, you already told us you transitioned from teaching school to doing some open mics to getting some paid gigs. I'm assuming it in 1984 you decided to go. Full uh, 1984 on pro. was when I gave up my own class, and then I subbed for a year or two, weaned my way out of it, and then well, that uh, seems smart. Yeah, and uh, Bob Fisher at the Ice House, God bless him. Yeah. I auditioned out there and I started getting some of that road work that he had. He had a lot of work. And then I, how did I work, hook up with you? Somebody gave me your name and I just sent you a tape or something? I don't know. Yeah, that's how I got a lot of people, either referrals or tapes. I mean, yeah. we used to get stacks. This is back for those uh, in, in podcast land. This was a VCR <laughs> tape uh, before CDs and before uh, live streaming. Uh, but, you know, you, you would get these, we would get stacks of cassettes and, and go through them. And you have but, to go through the whole thing. You can't clog ahead or chapters and right right you have to actually listen to it the whole thing and and i learned pretty quick to delegate that to somebody else (laughs) really yeah i would have one of my staff okay watch these 10 and then tell you know tell me who you think i should see right but what was interesting about booking comedy in sacramento is sacramento and northern california were stuck with my sense of humor in other words i had to really enjoy the comedy from somebody for them to get booked. Oh, okay. And so if, if, if there was somebody that I found offensive or a little um, uh, gross or edgy that I didn't think would fit the Sacramento market, right. I, I would just say thanks, but no thanks. But uh, it, it I'm only bringing it up because guys like you were the reason the club were such a huge success because I did believe in clean comedy because you have to work a little harder, write a little better to get the laughs to be uh, a clean comic. That's and true. then headliners like both of you guys uh, and Steve Bruner and Tim Bador and Jeff Jenna, we can go on and on and on dropping Jones? names. Tim Jones. Tim Jones yeah. uh, mm-hmm. Well, Vince Champ. I mean, they're all funny people. <laughs> they were all clean uh, comics. And all clean go, comics. And now they go, but... why are they laughing? <laughs> Google Vince Champ. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but the, the, the point was is that I think that was one of the reasons why Laughs Unlimited not only – did so well for me those 21 years I had it, but it's still going today. And one of the few clubs over 40 years wow. later, that's still going strong. But anyway, we when did digress. You, when did your 21 years start? What year did you take over? We uh, no, didn't take over. I started it. Okay. Um, with the help of Bob Saget, Coulier, um, those guys, Dana Carvey and uh, George Wallace were really huge and helped me get started. Wow. Uh, it was 1980. We opened in August of 1980. Oh, okay. And I first met Coulier was my very first contact. And I met him in, I think it was April of 80. And it took me that, you know, a few months to get things together. And then we opened in August. Yeah, I hate to reverse the microphone on you but what got you into comedy 
I, I, I was selling life insurance. The people in the audience have heard this. I was selling life insurance <laughs> and, and really hated my job. And I was on vacation with my then girlfriend, soon to be wife, soon to be ex wife. Yep. I don't know if you guys remember Patty. <laughs> I remember, and yeah, I remember uh, Patty. we were on vacation. And we, my dad, who had a great sense of humor, said, okay, You got to go to this place called the Comedy Store. There's one in Westwood. And they had a satellite. Yeah. Small yep. club there. Used to work it all the time. Oh, did you? And yep. so I went over there and I go, man, Sacramento needs something like this. Because Sacramento back in 1980 was really pretty much a cow town. A pretty yeah. small. No, Took the words out of my mouth. Yeah. No no real social dynamic. Not a lot of culture. Um, <laughs> you know, we had ballet, but it was one ballerina. <laughs> <laughs> we had an orchestra, but it was one piccolo. Come on, you know. Come on. Yeah. Hey, I got more of these. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, so uh, that's really how it started. In and and, uh, and you stumbled onto that location. No, I wheeled and dealed. I had no money. I wheeled and dealed on everything, and it wasn't the firehouse. It wasn't the first club. Oh, it's across the alley. Yes, in the the basement of the Delta Queen restaurant. Oh, but again, oh, we're, oh, we're but sh- they already know. I do Sorry. remember hearing that. Story. No, no, no. We're we're yeah. there's new listeners all the time. That was so they're opinion. they're picking up some new <laughs> stuff. So you guys both work. Uh, you you both ended up with. Uh, uh, careers, Jimmy doing stand up, and uh, Stan went into acting, and then we're going to talk about it in a little bit. But a huge success, great career in voiceover work. Yes, yes. continues uh, today. Yes, but as road comics, was there any experience that was like really memorable, positive, or memorable bad that uh, may have affected your your path or, or you remember to this day? Yeah, well, I think this is what you're talking about. It was Dennis Wolfberg. Yo, great comic. I was a school teacher. I was in left school teaching. He was a school teacher. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we're working together at Laughs Unlimited. Working the road, other comics going, hey, you do teacher stuff. Dennis Wilberg does teacher stuff. You can't do that. And I went, <laughs> what? what? Okay, so then now I get a chance to work with Dennis Wolfberg. He's headlining. I go, Dennis, other people have been busting me because they say I do teacher. He goes, did you teach? I went, yeah. And he goes, well, then keep doing it. <laughs> yeah. I said, well, I don't, have to, I don't have to put it in my act. And he goes, look, I'll either refer back to you or I'll put it in another place or I won't do it. Relax. Just do what you. Oh, he was such mm. a, a, he was a great pro. He could write around anything. And he had a different experience. I mean, he taught like in the Bronx, New Ooh. York. Yeah. He was and in the junior high, and high school, too. Yeah. And, um, and you were in Omaha. Elementary. <laughs> oh my, yeah. And, so your toughest kid was was doing the corn cobs, right? Right. It was tough though. <laughs> it was. You tough. should have seen those corn cobs. <laughs> They're big, a, big, big kids. Shuck you. What? <laughs> it's corn language, buddy. So so it turned out okay though. Oh no, it was great. And Dennis, it, no, I love. And it. if I booked you together, I would have done it for that reason. Yeah. That right. you were both in it the same been a theme night. Huh? Yeah, theme kind yeah. of a comedy. Which I just had a flashback while we're talking about this. Dennis picked up the guitar and did Bye Bye Amer- American Pie. Yeah. And just the room, just he owned them. They were in his hand. I was sitting in the stairway in the club. Yeah. Oh. That was the best seat in the house. That and was. When yeah. Dennis would do that, which he didn't do very often. No, I know. Uh, it was uh, so special because he would do uh, Bye Bye Miss American Pie, but he did it very sincerely. And he wasn't a comic musician. He wasn't really a singer. I think... Oh, you guys, back me up on this. Doesn't it seem true, especially as an actor, that actors kind of want to be comics and comics, comics kind of want to be singers. actors or musicians? They want to be musicians. It's yeah. so funny because you could have a great career in comedy or in music and still, is the grass greener on the other side? Yeah, <laughs> you, know, exactly. Exactly. you want to try these There's other so art much. forms. So many actors that have bands that they go out on the road and, yeah. Exactly. Stan, did you have any gigs that were especially um, fun or bad or good stories? You know, I didn't have any really bad gigs. I remember working with a couple of bad comics that uh, I was in Seattle doing. I uh, can't remember the guy's name, but he booked. Uh, oh, Giggles? He booked Giggles. He booked uh, Tri Cities. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rich Lynn, he also booked Spokane. And I was working with a guy those three weeks. And yeah, just had some bad experiences with his. Drinking and drugs and bringing guys. You know, you wake up in the morning, you go downstairs, and there bodies all over the oh. floor, and you're like, who are these people? You know, yeah. That was probably the worst gig. Best gigs were always going back home to D.C. Oh, nice. Because all of my family and friends would come out. Yeah. I mean, they the people would call the club and go, is, is this the... 
the Earl Sellers that I remember from uh. eighth grade. <laughs> yeah, that's me. You go by stand now. Yeah, I can't talk to you now. I'm going to go on stage. You know? <laughs> but come on down tomorrow night. You that's know, funny. that was always great. See, and that's a, go ahead. One time I went home, and my dad, who really was responsible, for, uh, partly responsible for me coming to LA. My dad always said, you know, whatever, whatever I wanted to do, my dad was always go do it, go do it. You wow. want Give to it go a to shot. California? Go do it. I'll pay for the bus ticket. Whatever. Wow. Go do it, son. Well, he never saw me do stand up. And oh. one time I went to DC. My mother's always promoting me for whatever I was doing. But one time he came out to see me, and afterwards he gave me this huge hug, and he said, "I was surprised you were that clean," because he had heard. You know, he grew up listening to Red Fox. Sure. Red Fox was as dirty as. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, and that wasn't too dirty compared to guys who came later on. But he just thought I was going to be bluer. I don't know why I was not. Well, you it, know, it is sometimes. He just thought as a comedian. People think you know. comedy. I mean, even to this day, decades after the the sixties and seventies when comedy started, when you know they think of Lenny Bruce or some of the people that got it started, and I think there's a certain percentage of the population. That just thinks that stand-up comedy to be good has to be edgy. Yeah. Now, I, of course, did everything I could to prove that's not true. Right. But I, I understand where your dad was coming from because that is kind of a standard thought about yes. the art form. I will agree. Yeah. I will agree. You know, yeah. I've heard that. Yeah. Jimmy, where's your edge? You, yeah. got, you got no edge. Yeah. <laughs> Right. I'm just lovable. Shut People up. would say to me, well, me what would you talk about during your stand-up? I'd say, well, I talked about my kids, uh, talked about my wife, I talked about what it was like growing up in D.C. and what's yeah. happening in my life. And they just yeah. well, pull we, back and look at me like, we tried really? to, uh, yeah, <laughs> And we that's tr- funny? We try to teach young comics, and, and I do have a new book out. Check it out on Amazon. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that you want to talk about what you know. You want to talk about your life and yeah. what makes you different from... Like when you and Dennis both doing material about being teachers, but you're coming at it from different directions. Right. You have yeah. different experiences. Yeah. And so you have uh, uh, different jokes. You know, Dennis, one of his famous opening lines was how the kids, you know, would, would make up names. It was Dennis, you know, wolf shit, <laughs> you know, and stuff yeah. like that. Wolf man. And, exactly. yeah. uh, and, and you had a different approach because your experience with kids was different. But uh, at both the stand-up comics, now I know we're, I'm still trying to stay back in kind of the uh, 80s, 90s when you're doing learning your trade, and then to when you were professionally still doing comedy, what do you wish you knew in the beginning that you learned maybe 10, 15 years into it or 20 years into it? Like, what do you know now that you wish you knew when you started? Stan, anything stand out? Well, I'm a shy person. That's just me. I was I was a shy kid. I'm still I'm still a shy adult, and uh, it just took me a while to overcome that on stage. Even though I had material, I could go out and talk, do everything. I never forget Jill picking me up at the airport one time. I was we were talking about something. I remember saying to her something about I had a fear of being in front of crowds or something like that. She looked over at me like, you're in the wrong business. <laughs> Do you know where we're going right now? Yeah. You know? <laughs> you know? He's talking about Jill, now my wife. Uh, she was a wise person uh, then and now. Wow. Uh, yeah. But, but, but I, I, you know, I, I just wish I had a, you know, when I go out, I don't work as much as Jimmy. I work a couple of times a month if I'm lucky. And uh, I just have a more carefree attitude about doing stand-up. That but would I'm been- not afraid of not getting laughs. I take pauses. I wait for the audience because I, I'm more confident. I, I I know this is funny. You're going to laugh. If you're not laughing, I will patiently wait <laughs> for <laughs> you to get it. You're experienced and your wisdom has grown with it. And I think that that is something. But it would have been nice if you'd known that when you started, Jimmy, is there yeah. anything that uh, that you know now about being a professional comic that you wish you knew in 1984? Write. How to write? <laughs> write. No, just write. Writing is important. Write. Well, now I guess the young people call it content. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you got to keep coming. Now they keep. I'm sorry, keep trying to keep up with the kids. Well, you get new material and work on it, work it out, work on it. And what would I know? 
write, write more, commitment, work on people. I never upset anybody. I don't know. I, I, I love that part about being on the road because there was nothing else for me to do after getting up. I think I got up before all the other comics. But, <laughs> you know, I would sit there and just rewrite my act for the entire day and hopefully find something new and put that in that night. And I do miss that. I mean, I write with a couple of comics during the week. or But that, but that you're that. pointing out something that's interesting is that we both know road comics. I think the most famous might be John Fox, oh. who would party oh. yeah. all night long, gamble, drink, uh, meeting women of every shape and size, and and then sleep most of the day get up, maybe have a meal, and then he's ready to go back up on stage. Yeah. Um, Steve Bruner, who's done a couple of these interviews and a, and a good friend of mine and a prolific comedy writer. We write together on Wednesday nights. There you go. Yeah. Is always talking about the importance, and it's in my book, uh, <laughs> 20 Questions About Being a Stand-Up Comic, available on Amazon, um, about how important it is to not only does it, are you not going to necessarily use all the material you write, but it keeps you fresh and it keeps you focused and it keeps you your mind sharp. Now, Jimmy, I know that you were saying that was something you wish you had done more. Yeah. You've been doing comedy now for 30, 40 years. I Do you, know. Is writing part of your plan each day or each week? Well, the pandemic put a little, I didn't, the pandemic put a little snarl into that. Because I like to, I'm one of those people, though, I wrote more on stage, played with an idea. And as compared to sit, because I always was fascinated by people like Stan and other writers. Say so you can actually sit down and just write, because that I would I was better when I was working the road a lot and writing on stage. And we are fascinated by guys like you. <laughs> but <laughs> I can't make it up on stage. I I know guys that can just take that little right. That little, uh, you know, and see, well, that's an, an interesting and, dynamic for the, for those of you listening that have any interest in the art form is that we have two professionals that have made a great living in the industry. And those there really are two types of comic entertainers, those that write prolifically to find those gems and those that will work on something on stage over and over and over until you get it right. And I'm assuming you record your sets. Yep. So that you can play them back and find those gems. Exactly. And then each time you do them, you're putting some twist or different verbiage on it. Or dropping wasted space. Right, yes. right. Yeah. Because you want Editing. It's, it, it Editing. Is. Yeah. Oh, is that what it's called? Yeah, that's what it's called, brother. <laughs> Editing the content. Ah. <laughs> but, but it is interesting because you are taking that raw diamond and your, or that lump of coal and your, your chick chiseling away at it and adding pauses and adding words and dropping words and you end up and, and it's so funny because it's been said on the podcast and i think it's so important that people understand that uh comics may look like they're coming up with an idea on stage for the first time right that's called acting <laughs> they've actually done that bit over and over and over the first time you see robin williams at holy city zoo yes he's, he's amazing working on he's stuff. brilliant yeah oh my gosh yeah. then you see him the second time you go Hey, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> That's what he did that other time. Mm -hmm. and then you watch him the third time, and you go, he's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> but Ro uh, and Robin talk about did... making it up on stage. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, they, yeah. But Robin, even though he he had that cache of material in his brain, that that file folder, he would throw it out in different places. Yes. Where uh, somebody like a really talented guy like uh, Dennis Wolfberg would have a, a, and most comics would have a set that's based on this bit that goes to this bit right. that goes to yeah. this bit and there's transitions and callbacks, right? That's kind of the, the norm. Robin was able to really succeed by throwing out so much funny crap that if 60% of it hit, he was so fast, he had the audience yeah, going. Exactly. He's got a machine gun. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Now see, that's why I never understood people like Stephen Wright. Oh, to joke, 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 because what you're talking about is what I, I tell stories, and it's got a callback or a tag here, yeah. and it makes it's got, it's kind of linear, got, yeah. it's got a through line. Right. He just looks like he's telling jokes, and I'm going, how do you keep it in order? How do you remember? Ah, that fascinates me. Yeah, but that is a whole different style, but it is. I th I think if if Stephen was here and we had a chance to ask him, he would say, "Well, I have this block of." one-liners and this block of one-liners and depending on the audience because i always say that there uh de you know you can't do the same 
set necessarily the same way on a Friday night late show as you did on a oh, Wednesday night no. half audience oh, show. No, amen. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so there's a, there is some talent and experience that's brought to bear there. Now we we've name dropped a few people that uh, we've all interacted with and worked with, uh, but let's. Uh, Start with you, Jimmy. I know that uh, as a professional comic, you've toured. We mentioned with Brad Garrett, Arsenio yep. Hall, yep. George Lopez. These are guys are all huge stars in the business, icons of comedy. And getting the opportunity to tour with them must have been a great experience. And then, so I want you to speak to that. But also, was there anybody that you really uh, learned something from or uh, that you really respected that out in the business okay two things you helped on that because <clears throat> because of working clean so i'd meet these guys because i we should tell people i became the house mc at the ice house oldest co- comedy you club tell. in the country well okay i'll tell <laughs> I think you just did <laughs> <laughs> so because of working at the ice house i got to meet all, all kinds of people and that's where i met george lopez and started working with him and that's where i met uh uh who else arsenio arsenio, arsenio. oh that's an interesting story because arsenio i thought it was a joke I worked with Arsenio the first time at the Ice House. We get, he kind of hit it off, whatever. And then I get a phone call in the middle of the week. Hello. Hello. Hi. <laughs> this is so-and-so. And we, Arsenio wants to know if you want to work with him down at the improv. And I thought, I went, Larry. I thought it was a buddy of ours. Larry, <laughs> <laughs> Larry stop it. And the guy goes, who's Larry? And it was, it was, it was genuine. It was real. And uh, yeah, that's when I first worked with Arsenio down at the Spectrum and worked with him for off and on for 20 years. I wanted to—I I don't want to digress too great. much, but working with Arsenio, I would have find that uh, uh, so different because his audience is so different. I mean, at the Dog Pound, and you had that that different energy. And did was it? Oh, go ahead and say it. His audience was black. No, no. <laughs> Go ahead and say all right, it. All right. all right, that's what you're saying. And how did you work that, Jimmy Burns? <laughs> from Jimmy Burns well, is Omaha. white. <laughs> I'm white. The, the oh, you code know what? word is white. <laughs> so here's the deal. Uh, I did warm-up for the most recent Arsenio Hall show. Not the one that was back in the 90s, 89, 90, 91. Well, the second yeah. one, second yeah. version. And the audience aged with all of us. Hmm. There, was, there was young people in there, but there was uh, some of us veterans some of us, yeah, I, it went well. But I grew up in a neighborhood that was ethnic. So, and yeah, but I you didn't have to do anything different. You did your act because I just did my act. Funny's funny. Oh, right. and yeah. clean, and yes. which is easier for someone like Arsenio to follow. Yes, it, it, exactly. It's, it, I, I, this has kind of been said before, but I want to say it again. You cannot have a really filthy, dirty act and then bring up uh, a clean headliner. It makes it almost impossible to, to grab find. that uh, audience back. Yeah. However, a somewhat edgy act like Arsenio, who's not perfectly clean, would right. prefer somebody clean in front of him right. because yeah. it sets up the audience so much better for him, right? Right, it yeah. does. I, that's what I was going to say. That's part of your benefit. Of uh, that's You helped in the sense of encouraging people to work clean because I didn't taint an audience. Is that, is that what it is was? It? I don't know. Is well, you word? don't want to take the audience down the wrong path. Unless now I book blue shows. I used to like uh, booking guys. Remember Jack Marion? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, extremely not dirty. Uh, no. It's so funny. He's a blue comic, but he wasn't filthy in the sense that there wasn't a lot of f bombs and stuff. Okay. But he talked all about sex and stuff, and so it was considered a dirty show. But uh, I love booking acts like that. But you had to set up the audience correctly. Yeah. And definitely. as the MC, my job was to tell the audience, "Say hey, this show's going to be." A little edgier, a little dirtier than you might be used to, but I think you'll enjoy it. Those of you expecting yeah. Bob Hope are going to be disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, but the, I got to say this about the, who I learned from, who I respected, and that was Richard Jenny. I got a chance to work with him the last seven months of his life. And he loved, unlike, okay, I love Arsenio, and he just wanted me to meet him at the club, put him on stage, hold the audience, and then when he's gone. And that's all we did, it interacted, and that was fine. Richard loved to hang out. And even during the day at the mall, he loved food courts at the mall. So I would come to his suite or whatever in the afternoon and we would work on stuff and he would be writing stuff. And then he'd be, we'd go to eat. And then on that, that night, he was working it on stage. And then the, he recorded it. And then the next day, we'd go over it and write again. And I wish, I'm going to cry. I wish he wouldn't have done what he did. He, he had some problems. 
and he ended his life. And I loved working with him, and I was learning so much and respected it so much. Hmm. Well, but, the, but it is interesting that you, uh, with all the prof- professionals that we know of as celebrities, and Richard Jenny is known in, in certain aspects of show business, but he's not a name like uh, right. Carvey or Leno or, or Seinfeld. But um, still, you picked up something from him, even though you work with lots of people. Now, Stan, you've worked both in acting and on stage with all kinds of uh, legends of entertainment. Was there anybody that kind of uh, taught you something or that you admired that uh, was fun for you to work with that you took something away from? You know, I think every headliner I ever worked with because, oh, you, that's you know, the progression. Good answer, business. actually. <laughs> no, you know, you start as an opener. You want to be the middle act. When you become a middle, you want to be the headliner. So I'm sitting in the wings as an opener watching the middle and the headliner. And when I became a middle, I'm watching the headliner trying to figure out how do I get that job. So like Jimmy was saying, sitting on the steps at laughs at, at Firehouse and watching, you know, gosh, yeah. everybody from Jerry Seinfeld, to Denny Johnson to, I mean, you just name them and, you know, all the guys. But I think the biggest thing I learned, which... Jimmy Rook has a regret about, and that's writing, and that that was really, I think, the thing that Did made you me a better. Was, it, comic. was there somebody that uh, stood out? Any anybody you want to name drop that you well, thought uh, this a guy person... you've already mentioned two or three times, Steve Bruner. Bruner yeah. and I still write. We've everything I've written through the years, whether it's been sketch, storytelling, whatever. I'll send it to Bruner and say, you know, give me a little polish on that, and he'll send it back with. <laughs> You really? know, yeah, he'll mark it up with, you know, different color pens nice. and what have you. And, you know, he sends me stuff. A I'll mark up his stuff. Exactly. Yeah, we'll go back and forth. And we still do that to this day. I've known Steve for about 30 years. So that's if I'm working with him, you know, one of your clubs or we're on the road. We've been on the road together. We're writing during that week. Always. Wow. And uh, Steve Bruner and Jim Farrell. So. Yeah, and it's funny that Jim still does some of that, but he's gone off, you know, he's a wine expert, a, a yeah, sommelier, a of class, third class sommelier, something like that, as high as you can get, and knows his wine, but, you know, has has his one foot in comedy and still likes writing. Yeah, wow. still but, a good writer. You know, I don't good. think he performs anymore or he not does. much. Does he's, he? Yeah, he's still performing. Matter of fact, he's doing... He's a close uh, personal friend of mine. So <laughs> <I'm glad laughs> He's doing storytelling. Well, actually, it's uh, comics. It's uh, taking your stand-up and turning them into stories. So he's doing that. And, uh, that's yeah, awesome. Stand-up. Yeah, I think he had a gig last weekend. Man. Oh, well, that's good to yeah. hear. I'm a, he owes me that song, Gun. I've been trying to get a hold of him. <laughs> oh. He's in my part of the country, too. Yeah. Well, so we, we've talked about uh, a lot of things and um, people we've worked with and things we've learned. One of the things that I find fascinating, and since you're both performing, I would love your two cents on I'm a huge fan of the comedy that I lived in the eighties and nineties, really, especially the eighties were just the rock and roll era of standup comedy. But how would you compare comedy today from then? Or maybe even, you know, how, I mean, I would think the audiences now would be so much more difficult, but maybe it's just, a different i mean teach me is it a, just a different way to do the same thing or is it different than we're gonna it was sound in the very 80s? old <laughs> but these kids <laughs> i tell you <laughs> with the content oh my does <laughs> mr burns mr it's burns just, <laughs> it's bodily functions and I, there's one I want to refer to, but I don't even want to do it. But I tell you, I don't know how. Oh, many... I mean, they like the more basic. Uh... I'm talking about the comics. Oh, the comics are talking. The about comics, the comics are, talking are about. not putting any effort into the writing. Oh my god, oh, that's too bad. So focused on the posterior. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> bodily function. Can't even bring myself to say ass. But that's just. <laughs> imma- but that's just so immature. I think now the I'm a producer. Is, I think more. They're getting more into shock. Again, I sound old, uh, but it's like no. more shock, not not a clever, not a punchline. So I'm not put, everybody. But I'm going to put you on task because Uh-oh. back even in the 80s and 90s, part of my job as the producer of the show or director of the show is that I would see 10 comics and three or four of them always were exactly as you said. They were generic. They were crass. They were, uh, you know, I went to the freaking store to get some freaking bread for my freaking bitch wife, yeah. you know. Yeah. that they thought was funny and they would get maybe a shock reaction from the sure. audience but i was able to not support them and support the people that even if they weren't as funny 
but we're making an effort to write and be clean and 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 develop a set. Now today in the 2020s, <laughs> yes, <laughs> now I'm sounding very old. Um, is it this? Is it really the same? And 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 the clubs aren't making them work, or is it the audience has changed? Oh, that's a good question. But coming out of the pandemic, so many so many of everything shut down, and so. I haven't been out in the clubs. I've been at the Ha Ha last night and tomorrow night. Um, I'm, that's a good question. I don't know, Scott. <laughs> Stan, any thoughts? You know, uh, the difference between now and then. Um, you know, one thing I noticed, uh, this is probably pre-pandemic, is that the rhythm of comedy changed uh, with a lot of the young, young stand-ups. And by that, I mean... We were the Tonight Show generation. Yeah. We, our goal was to get on Tonight Show, for some of us. So you had to be clean. And you had to have that first joke come out, uh, that first laugh, let's say, in a matter of... It was a timing thing. You know, you know whatever they said. Your first, man, your first 20 seconds, you better have a laugh. You know, yeah. whatever. And you better back that up with more laughs. And, you know, it was a rhythm thing. But now... A lot of the stand-ups, the younger stand-ups, aren't in a hurry to get to the laugh. And the setups, to me, are a little watered down. But the audiences are patient with them. They will wait one and a half minutes for that setup really? to get to the joke. That's what I found with See, I thought it was the just the opposite. This is this seems to me to be the, you know, I'm important, my time, I have no time, you know, I got to I got to get to what I got to do this. Where's my phone? Right. Right. I thought they were less patient. You're saying they're more patient. I find that they're more Well, that's cuz they're on their and, phone. <laughs> well, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean I I and I said like I said this was this was me going to close pre-pandemic. And I just felt that there was a lot of fat in there. I'm, I'm, e I'm editing their content. Going, you can take that out. You can take that out. You don't need that. You don't. Need mm -hmm. that. Oh man, that's way well, too many words. It is. There, it know? is funny. Come on, I, get to the joke. Get to the joke. Yeah, get to the funny. And here's the joke right here. Get to that. Be know? funny. Well, uh, one of the things I had heard, and I, I got to be honest, I'm not listening to a lot of current stand-up comedy, and that's bad on my part, especially as a podcaster. But the podcast is about, you know the 80s and 90s in my world of, of comedy and my audience tends to be older males you know over 40 and and they relate more to what uh, we're talking about but when i have listened to new young comics it seems like almost like an on-stage therapy session oh, that, yeah, too. you Anger, know and, yeah. and and there are people that had done that in the past but on a funnier way now you know it seems like somebody goes up and well i'm doing drugs and uh you know my my girlfriend left me and well, let's do some comedy. <laughs> and it's just, it, it, it's, it's like, you know, go find a bartender or a hairdresser to right. listen to your shit. Why are you boring an audience with yeah. it? You know, and another thing about uh, a that lot of That might be comics, harsh. Could be. But a lot of, uh, to me, a lot of the comics now, stand-up isn't, um, we did stand-up because we liked, we were, our idols were stand-ups. Yeah. You know, Carson, Carlin. Uh, Cosby, uh, you name them on the on the Tonight Show. Um, oh, uh, and and Ed Sullivan's show before that. You know the the stand ups who came out with you know just a suit and a skinny tie King. and King. Yeah, who am I looking for? King. I can't find. His, um, can't find. It. Don King. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Alan King. Alan King. Alan. Oh, King. Alan King. Yes. Yes. Oh you man. Know. Yeah, all the stand-ups. And, you know, I remember Tony the Ball saying to me something about, you know, we're doing this because we like being stand-ups. We're not in it for the money. And who knew about making money when we first started in this business, you know. But um, a lot of the stand-ups I run into now, they're actors who are looking to do something to make themselves sellable. Oh, sense? okay. Right. So They're I can do this, I can themselves. do this, I can do this. It's I part can of their this. marketing. Exactly. It, but they have no, they don't have the passion, the love for stand-up, for comedy. It, it's like more of a vehicle to an end as opposed to what they want to focus on, the art form. Exactly. See, I, I like working right. with the guys. I mean, I, I, again, I'm name dropping, but, you know, uh, three of my guys that I worked with for many years, uh, Leno, Seinfeld, and Saget, 
are still out doing stand-up. They're multimillionaires. They don't have to work yeah. a day in their life if they don't want to. And guess what? They're, They're out doing working. shows each and every week. Why? Yeah. They, love they love this art form. Yeah. yeah. Hey, was Shandling? He was in your club. Oh, yeah, a lot. Love Gary. No, Gary was my very... Flashback, everybody in the audience. (laughs) August of 1980, my very first opening act, his first gig out of Phoenix, Arizona, his hometown, Gary Shandling. Nice. Made 150 bucks for a week. For a week? Yeah. (laughs) Gary Shandling, multimillionaire. I think prices went down after that. <laughs> How do you get 150 bucks? Got to the club. <laughs> Shandling had it all. <laughs> but it, uh, we were talking a minute ago about you were talking, uh, throwing out some names of some old comics that that we kind of aspired to or that we enjoyed when we were kids, yeah. and that's where we got our vision of the art form. Right. But then you talk about the audiences now, and I'm kind of, and I was alluding to this whole woke environment has made oh. it so difficult. Imagine a Don Rickles. Oh. Going to uh, in front of a college crowd in this day right. and age. I mean, he'd be tarred and feathered. Although the kids wouldn't know what that was, but <laughs> no, he'd never. They'd never book him. They'd cancel the booking. Whoever booked him would would get fired. I mean, yeah, they, they, it would just never happen. But he was a funny guy that was that had TV shows. And harmless. And was, no, he's a oh, stick. You know, he's yeah. harmless. Yeah. yeah. Well, his his but, attitude was, I'm making fun of everybody because we're all humans. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, couldn't fly now. Yeah. Well, obviously. They don't even it, listen. You know, I got Catholic stuff. And just bringing up the word Catholic, oh, you can see them shut down, some people. So sensitive. Yeah. Well, what I think is worse about today's woke environment is it's it. we're all aware of people that can get insulted through their own sensibilities uh, when we're on stage. I mean, as the MC, I'm sure I pissed off people. But what's bad now, I think, and you guys can give me your two cents, is that it's not enough that you might offend them. They think you're offending everybody else or somebody else. I used to do this old joke about somebody in the audience would be wearing an ugly sweater, and they'd say, oh, geez, did you get that at Kmart, and who's shopping for you? And right. I'd call them Sweater Boy for the rest of the show. It was just a, get, you know, a bit to kind of keep the running thing. And Sweater Boy never cared. He liked getting the attention. But I have a fear that in this day and age, there's a percentage of the audience that go, he's picking on him. Yeah. You know, and what about the people that manufactured that wool? He's not being <laughs> sensitive, right? I think, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I, I you know, I, I really don't know. <laughs> I think uh, it just... Well, you I, guys are out of I think it depends. You know, I, I really haven't had a problem with... Uh, you know, any of my material, not that I'm out there to offend anybody, and I haven't seen any audiences really turn on a comic these days. I think when you walk through a, through the doors of a comedy club or a comedy night that you have to... And you know, if you're you offended, gotta, leave. Yeah, It's, it's exactly, on you, right? right? Yeah, and if you're there to, you know, thinking you're going to be offended, then well, perhaps you shouldn't be going to I mean, a I'm sitting here with two... Because as comics, yeah. we got the floor, we got the mic. We're yeah. going to say whatever it is that... That's right. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> so, but I'm working with, I'm, I'm sitting here with two um, highly respected professionals, headliners for many, many years, both perfectly clean. So maybe you're the wrong audience, but I mean, yeah. I'm sure it's got to be a, a little bit of a struggle for Bob Saget, who, you know, is still pretty edgy, but it could just be that if you're funny, <laughs> the funny overrides the wokeness, and I'm just not aware of it. I'm laughing yeah, because I worked with Bob Saget one Bob time Saget. at the Ice House. Yeah. He was getting ready for a corporate gig. Oh. And he's working. I got to work clean, Jimmy. I said, okay. <laughs> he goes, but you know what? When You know I'm in trouble when I pick up the guitar. Yeah. <laughs> but he, I'm going to try to put it off for 20, 30 minutes. <laughs> Picked it up in like six. (laughs) (laughs) A lot of people don't know he's a comic musician. He used to do a lot of music back in the day. Uh, You know, if you were a fan of his on Full House or Fuller House or saw him do one of his even kind of uh, risque, uh, more dirty stage shows, uh, he doesn't bring out the guitar on most of those gigs. But when he's comfortable or needs it, (laughs) uh, he he, but even the songs he would do could be a little uh, edgy. So... and I got to defend the woke people. Okay. <laughs> good for you. They have a sense of humor, too. They do? Yes. Oh, that's so good to hear. Yes, they do have a sense of humor. Good, good, yeah. good. So I, I mean, was worried. But, no. <laughs> hey, but I'm going to use a word. You know, because we're talking about new comics and all this stuff. I, I think I would be compared. I, I have a gentler comedy. Does that make sense? Gentler? As, yeah. 
It's like a kind of petting gentler. a warm puppy. A kind of gentler comic. <laughs> and then the puppy lifts its leg and pees on you. <laughs> Well, no, but it's, go ahead. Finish your thought. Well, you think that the, oh. even though there is a woke audience that uh, maybe well, outside of a comedy club, they'd be more judgy. But well, in only a because you only because you've used it a couple of times. And I just think you, you're generalizing the audience. Oh, yeah. And going and thinking that because they're of a certain age or background that they may be offended. But I th- again, I think when people walk through a com- the doors of a comedy club or a comedy event... I, I'd like to think they have a sense of humor. Exactly right, uh, just, and there are there. Yeah, there can be some things that offend. I mean, listen, I'm I can watch some of the younger comics, and particularly some uh, female comedians who say things that offend me, and I ouch. Ooh, yeah. Wow! <laughs> oh well, and I think everybody and, has a line in the sand. That, that, yeah, that, so that that's is, that's that's right. pretty much what it and, is. Whatever. But I whatever appreciate you, you them, yeah. straightening me out because I haven't been. I MC a lot of shows, and and I do a little humor when I MC, but it's nothing like the old days. And oh. I'm never the star of the show, so I do have this kind of fear that if I get in front of the wrong audience, and and they're they're going to be more judgy than they used to be in the 80s. And what you're saying is funny is funny. Funny is funny. And, and if they're there for comedy, that whatever their uh, persuasion, they're, they're open to having a good time. And that's really important to hear because, to be honest, I wasn't aware and not sure. And people out in the audience, feel free to send me hate mail. But it <laughs> and is, it's that confidence thing where, I look, I wrote this. This is funny. You guys... You offended? Screw you. This is fine. <laughs> yeah. This is, you want to go, uh. Well, there is, is some fun. strength in that confidence and the fact that you're a pro. Yeah. I mean, it's not like you're an open mic or trying right. something. Yeah. You you, you know yeah. that, hey, this worked last week on this stage. I know it's good. I know it's funny. And the audience picks up on the confidence knowing that you're going to take us for a ride. Right. We exactly. trust you. Right. From the minute you step on stage. Yeah. 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 Well, exactly. see, that, that. That answers it all. The show is over. <laughs> <laughs> Boys and girls. <laughs> no, if no, you've no, learned no. nothing else. <laughs> I, I did, uh, as we wind down, I did want to ask one more question. So uh, sports athletes get injuries over time with age and stuff. Uh, would you say that, um, is there anything being a long time road comic, a, a long time in this particular industry, this art form that may have changed you Physically, mentally, emotionally, that, that, you know, good or bad, that, uh, you know, how has stand up comedy affected your life? Your chosen career, your chosen art form, did it? It's been fun. Yeah. So I love the a, journey. I love the path. Yeah. I'm, I'm with Jimmy on that. As for, as for habits, I quit drinking 1991. That's why I'm still here. <laughs> That's good. That was the first, the first divorce. And, uh, but I, it was fun. I, I, it was, it was a riot. I'm when I'm sitting in the old people's home. I'll have a smile. <laughs> if I can still remember what. Yeah. But the having story fun. Well, that's kind of why know, I love this podcast. Well, I'm reconnecting and reliving these things. Go did ahead. we know each other before we had lunch? I remember you were. I yeah. was at Citrus Heights, and you were, you, or in Old Town, or oh, whatever yeah. it was. Yep. And we met for lunch. Did yes, we, we know did. each other before Scotts? Probably, you know, maybe open mics in L.A. But I knew, Larry, I knew Larry from, from Open Mics. His best buddy is uh, Larry Omaha. Larry Omaha, who was going to be here, here, but he got a gig. Yeah, he's working. But I remember that doing bastard. Open Mics with Larry. So. <laughs> but, he's, yeah, from, but there's a guy that's that's uh, older in age, yep. and he is still out there. Still doing he's working more than ever. Yes, Yeah, working the boards yeah. And, yeah. and doing his stuff. Some great stuff. So uh, God bless uh, Larry Omaha. I hope that uh, we fact, get a chance to talk to him. Talked to him last night. He got four more weeks from Norwegian cruise ships or something. Awesome, yeah, yeah. awesome. So, but, you know, um, I, in ahead. answer to yeah. that question, I, I didn't... What was... It? <laughs> it was well, is there what, anything that, over, that, that 20, 30 years of doing road work or comedy, how has it affected your life, good or bad, that, and Jimmy was saying, well, it's made him, he's had a happy life, he's going to go to the old age home with a smile on his face, and that's a great way to see it. We know, both of us, all three of us know people that um, this industry took him to the grave before it should have. Yeah. So there, there's good and bad, just like any industry. You know, just right. like we're the analogy was sports. There's guys that, that uh, uh, you know, work in a sport for 20, 30 years and, and go away with their, their trophies and, and they had a great life. And there's others that get injured 
in the fifth or sixth year, and that industry ruined them. Jerome yeah. Bettis <laughs> can't hardly walk. There you go. From no, me, I didn't carry the ball. Nothing. Uh, no, I, I, I think uh, for me, you know, I'm, I'm like Jimmy. I'll be in the old age home, you know, telling stories. Maybe, maybe not telling stories. Hopefully, but telling people that I did, did stand up comedy back in the day. And for me, my badge of honor was having done it when I did it, because, like you said, that was the that was the rock of the eighties. I mean, hey, yeah, I mean, we were. <laughs> we were lauded back in the day, man. I oh, mean, really. No, I'd be on a plane true. flying somewhere, and, you know, a guy next to me, you know, where you going? Uh, uh, he's going to uh, wherever uh, for a corporate meeting. Where are you going? I'm going up to uh, Sacramento. What do you do? I'm stand-up comedy. Oh, my God. Really? You're a comedian? Oh, my God. I always wanted to do that. I'm doing it, man. <laughs> yeah. I'm doing it, okay? And making yeah. a living, which is, you know, a, a yeah. very small percentage of people that try comedy can make a, a lifelong uh uh, career out of it, and you guys are two shining yeah. examples of that. And my uh, best friends, uh, you know, I got Jimmy, Larry, Bruno, Bruno. I got, yeah. And and you're all still friends and doing that. And I and thanks to this podcast, I get a chance to reconnect. And for everybody listening, it was all Jill's idea. So anyway, <laughs> uh, let me let me uh, wind things down by uh, going uh, back to you, Stan. I know that uh, we were just chatting about your life experiences. But we we didn't really we already talked about it in your one on one interview. But let's just catch the audience up real quick. You've made a great career the last fifteen twenty years as a voiceover artist. Twenty seven. Wow, twenty seven years. Kind of started when Sabrina was. Uh, wow, in the womb. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. So that that is uh, for those in the audience. Stan, what, Stan, why don't you explain for, for those less uh, known? Yeah, what's voiceover? <laughs> what's well, voiceover work? <laughs> basically, what I, the end of uh, the part of the voiceover business I do, I do basically what you could call vocal foley. So huh? we Ooh, go in and Technical add term, dialogue. everybody. Yes. Vocal foley. foley. Yes, because foley artists go in and foley. They do all the uh, the sounds. Of, yeah, the uh, gunshots, the footsteps, the right, chewing. Tinkling of the glasses and whatnot oh. but we go in and add dialogue to movies and uh, tv shows basically if the is, uh, how, what, we make it sound like all of the extras are talking yeah what is what is the the isn't there a certain amount of mumble mumble, mumble? i mean no years ago they usually... used to do peas and carrots peas and carrots peas and carrots oh because uh, that's probably where i heard it yeah and they used to do uh and you're not doing that these things. days we don't do that these days. Okay. No, we say actual words in the background. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. We do everything from uh, fight efforts. We do... Uh, sex? Uh, we do... Uh, yep. We A little do, heavy breathing. We do heavy breathing for sex scenes. Yes, Calm we down. do. Calm down, Jimmy. We sometimes do the climax. <laughs> yes, we do. We do uh, police radio, fire... Uh, oh, yeah. Fire radio. Somebody coming do, through a radio. Yep. That's we perfect. do... Uh, if there's a TV on in the background, we do that. We do uh, just a, a myriad of things. Now, yeah. is this been guy, the same group? guy on fire uh, oh. falling out a window? Yeah, we do that exactly. Is this the same group of people that you've been working with for twenty seven years, or are people come and gone? Different people, yeah, different groups, and uh, it's a small community of people in LA who do it. Uh, it's like warm up comedians. Exactly. Everybody yeah. knows where everybody's at. Yep. Yep. Pretty much. And that's yeah. a great career. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And it can lead somewhere. Uh, well, we'll talk about this uh, off the mic. But uh, so everybody will have to pay attention to another show. <laughs> so tell me about uh, Jimmy. What do, what do you got coming up in, in 2022 that uh, the audiences might be looking for you? Wow. I don't know. I'm, I'm 2022, I know what's happening tomorrow night, Saturday night at the Ha Ha Cafe on Lancashire in North Hollywood. All right. I'll be... Benjamin, uh, 2022. No, TV shots, shots, no books, no uh, uh, salacious uh, autobiography, no. anything. <laughs> oh, uh, next month, I'll be at Brad Garrett's Club in uh, Las Vegas. There you go. November 15 through 20, whenever this airs, it's too late. <laughs> <laughs> but look for you because you will be back. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Stan, I know that you're you're always doing voiceover work, but what projects uh, in 2022 are, are, have you excited or you in your... Um, Plans. Well, I am uh, probably 1st of January. We will start uh, shooting a five-episode series I wrote called The Break Room. Yeah? And oh, it's cool. A, uh, it's a, just a small web series, and they're short episodes. Each episode is probably about eight minutes. But we're going to do uh, five episodes, and we hope to have them up on YouTube. If not, it's 
own, in addition to its own website, probably by April or May. Awesome. Well, that's great. Well, ladies and gentlemen, keep an eye out for that. And all you yeah. have to do is either Google Jimmy Burns or Stan Sellers. Guys, it has been so great catching up. I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you took your time to uh, fight the traffic and come and do this with me here in a uh, uh, hotel room. But uh, <laughs> it's been wonderful to uh, see you both and have you part of the bod- podca- podcast. Podcast. Hey, hey, podcast. What the hell's going podcast. on here? Bob's here tomorrow night. Hey. <laughs> open, the, open the door. He's got a <laughs> podcast. I should not be drinking while working. No, uh, but thank you so much for being here. And uh, we will. Uh, my audience will hopefully hear you both uh, in other shows. But thanks for being with us. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for joining us for this day's, uh, today's roundtable. Uh, let's hear it for Jimmy Burns. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Wow. And our other star, Stan Sellers. Yay. Oh, thanks, guys. You guys have been great. Ladies and gentlemen, stay tuned. There'll be another great show next week. Thanks for listening. Be sure to share and rate the podcast when you get a chance. All right. Thanks for joining us. Bye. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Stand Up Comedy, your host and MC. For information on the show, merchandise, and our sponsors, or to send comments to Scott, visit our website at www.standupyourhostandmc.com. Look for more episodes soon and enjoy the world of stand-up comedy. Visit a comedy showroom near you.